Hello and welcome to the first of two videos covering Chapter 12 in Democracy in America, and we're focusing on the presidency uh, in this chapter. Uh, we're going to start off with a little numerical quirk. Uh, there are 44 men who have been president of the United States. But one of them, Grover Cleveland, was first elected in 1884 as the 22nd president, and then lost his bid for re-election in 1888 to Benjamin Harrison, who became the 23rd president. So far, so good. But then Cleveland came back in 1892 and defeated Harrison in a rematch. He's the only president to serve non-consecutive terms. And so this second term was considered the 24th presidency, and so Cleveland is also credited as the 24th president. So based on this system of counting, where we count Cleveland twice, Donald Trump, the 44th person to be president, is the 45th president of the United States. Now, of those 44 presidents, most of them uh, took office as a result of being elected by uh, the Electoral College or uh, the House of Representatives, if there was not a majority in the Electoral College. Uh, a handful were vice presidents who became president uh, after the elected president had died, uh, and one, Gerald Ford, became president when the elected president, Richard Nixon, resigned from office. So far, no president has been removed from office after being convicted in an impeachment trial, but two presidents, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton, were impeached by the House of Representatives before they were acquitted by the Senate. Now, the president's official powers and duties are spelled out in Article 2 of the Constitution, but the president has expanded those duties since the Constitution was ratified. Uh, the president has to run the executive branch of the government, work with Congress on passing legislation, represent the nation in dealing with foreign countries, direct the military, and serve as an unofficial leader of his uh, or her political party. Uh, now, when George Washington took office, the executive branch was very small. Today, it's a massive enterprise, not only as a result of the country's growth, but because the federal government has gotten involved in American society to a much larger extent over the last century. And so we need a bigger government to handle all of those added tasks. Now, most of the people who get the government's work done are permanent employees who might serve for decades under uh, a number of different presidents. IRS agents, FBI investigators, federal food inspectors, civil rights attorneys at the Justice Department, economists at the Labor Department. These are just a few examples of people who work as part of the executive branch but aren't chosen by a particular president or his team. But even if the same people are working for these different presidents, those different presidents want the government to do different things. So they use their power as chief executive to point the executive branch in the direction that they want to go. Uh, one major way that the president does that is by having the power to appoint many of the top officials in a lot of government departments. And it's then the role of those appointees to translate the president's agenda into reality. Uh, there are several subgroups worth noting within the executive branch. The vice president is the only other member of the executive branch who gets elected. Now, while the vice president has an official role in the legislative branch as presiding officer of the Senate, the Constitution gives the vice president no defined role in the executive branch other than checking in to make sure the president is not dead or incapacitated. But in most recent presidencies, the president treats the vice president as a close advisor and often assigns specific projects for the vice president to oversee. Now, beyond the vice president, you have the cabinet. The cabinet is the term for the heads of the executive departments, large government organizations established by Congress with responsibility for a significant area of American society. More on them in a minute. The executive office of the president includes a number of advisory groups and departments with specific roles designed to give the president information he or she needs and help the president carry out plans. The executive office also includes the White House staff, a group of advisors and professionals who help with strategy, communication, and the day-to-day -day affairs of the executive branch. Now back to the cabinet, there are over a dozen cabinet departments whose leaders are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. 
Uh, some examples of these departments are state, which handles interaction with foreign countries, treasury, which makes sure the government collects the money it needs, pays its bills, and also uh, makes sure that our uh, financial system is in good health. The Justice Department works to ensure that federal laws are followed. The Defense Department oversees the military and used to be known as the War Department. Um, there are other um, cabinet departments, each having uh, a specific role and task. Um, they're outlined uh, in the textbook, uh, also on the uh, White House's uh, website if you want to so sort of dive deeper into the individual cabinet departments. Now, in the executive office of the president, there are a number of agencies and advisory groups. Uh, some examples include the National Security Council, which is unsurprisingly dedicated to national security. The National Security Advisor and other members of the council work through all of the information that the government has at its disposal in order to ensure that the president understands what potential threats exist and how the country can respond. Um, the Council of Economics Advisors is a trio of experts who help the president understand what's happening in the economy and hopefully how the federal government can improve it. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, drills down into the details and helps the president prepare a budget proposal uh, and also make predictions about the effects of certain laws and policies. Uh, the president has to manage all of this. Uh, in the long run, many of the people in the executive branch are expected to make decisions about a lot of issues uh, and only get the president involved when the issue is so big or so challenging that it has to be personally handled by the person elected to be in charge. Um, so the president kind of has to set up an organization and a system so that the president doesn't have to take care of everything personally. Uh, if the executive office, if the White House is operating smoothly, then the president's agenda is being moved ahead and uh, you're not running into a lot of issues. If parts of the White House staff are fighting with each other or you're not able to kind of get on the same page, it's harder for the president to get uh, that agenda through. Now, all of this that we've set up is really only handling the president's responsibility as chief executive. Uh, in the next video, we'll discuss how the president interacts with the legislative branch, other countries, uh, and some of the other uh, roles that the president has. Uh, until then, I leave you with these questions for thought and discussion.